I probably share my testimony three, four, five times every day. Got to, because testimony is do it again. Do it again with the same power. You guys with me? Oh, you were talking about addictions and stuff today. I believe we need to be free from the addiction of unforgiveness. Just saying. I mean, do we want to go into 2024 with it? Can I walk around? I just, like, I, and I'm 54, Christmas Day, and I am just getting started, but I'm almost 20 years in, and I am so madly in love with Jesus, and nobody, people can assume what they think because of what they've thought, and from what they've heard, and from what they've presumed. But the truth of the matter is that you're the only one that's responsible for your relationship with Jesus. You can be accused and have everybody in the world, ah, this, that, and the other thing, and you better hold fast to your confession of faith without wavering. Your confession of faith, not just faith to be up here, not just faith to preach, not just faith to, faith to post dumb stuff on faith, Facebook and Instagram and... You guys with me? Oh, it's just okay. We'll see. I'm going to travel a little bit with you today. I am so excited to be here. I, I really am. I love William Costi. I love the family. I, I'm overwhelmed with what God wants to do. And what God wants to do is he wants us to stop all the little stuff. And he wants us to go to the big stuff to the big matters, like the big matters, like you loving the Lord Jesus and laying your gift at the altar after you've settled your junk. You guys all right? Okay, because I'm five days into a fast and I'm just going to be raw with you today. I am because I'm not eating. So the only thing I've got is the word. I've been feasting and I am overwhelmed with the fact that God's treasure is the fear of the Lord. It's his treasure. It's in Isaiah. It's in Isaiah 33, 6. It says his treasure is the fear. So like, what do you do with the treasure? Do you like, do you just keep it buried? It says that a man found a treasure in a field. Are you with me? And he put it back together, put the dirt back over it, went and sold everything he had just so he could buy that piece of property because he knew the treasure was in the field. And God gave up everything for us because we were the treasure in the field for him. Come on, we were the pearl of great price. We were everything. So he gave up everything so that he could get us back because he believes that we have the potential to be everything in him. But when you allow the enemy to infiltrate these thought processes and your feelings, because the body of Christ is notorious to live by feelings. She has lived by her feelings for way too long. And your feelings, apart from truth, don't matter. They might matter to you and they might matter to the people that you've corrupted with your feelings that are apart from the word, but you guys all right? Okay, I'm going to dig in a little because that's all I know how to do. Because if God set me free, he can set anybody free. But it's one thing to say you've been set free. It's another thing to walk in continual freedom. When you, when you have everybody saying whatever they're saying about you and believing what they're believing about you, it's important that I don't respond in a place where I'm retaliating against that, but I stay in union with God, but don't drop the message. People don't like the message of the fear of the Lord. They don't like it because the fear of the Lord absolutely is the number one byproduct of intimacy with him. When you have intimacy with him, you fear him and fearing him isn't being afraid of him. Fearing him is being terrified that you might be absent from his presence. Not just the omnipresence, because all of us have the omnipresence, because Jesus said, behold, I'll never leave them nor forsake them. He will be always be with us. But the presence of the Lord is different, the manifest presence. And I know we all say we're after that, but it's not just for your time of worship. It's for your life of worship. It's for continual fellowship and intimacy with God, where everywhere you go, you actually carry him wherever you go. And when all hell's against you, heaven is for you. It's just weird because sometimes all hell comes against you through people that say they love the Lord. 
That's not Jesus. Are you guys with me? Like, I think it's fitting for me to talk about this. I think it's, I think it's important that we don't change the subject till we're all free. What would it be like for you to never, ever be offended, for you to not be hurt by people, for you to never allow people sin against you to produce sin within you, for you to hold your heart in a place of stewardship to where you love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and there's no neighbor that you don't love? Guys, who's my neighbor? Everyone I see. The people that hate me the most are my neighbor. What am I to do? Should I avoid things, sweep things under the carpet? Should I just go to places where I'm liked and loved? Should I just go hang out where everybody loves me and everybody likes me and, and man, you're the best? No, that's not the key. The key is going wherever you are with him. The key is carrying the presence of the Lord everywhere you go and actually having good tidings of great joy, actually knowing that Jesus said, I have overcome or in this world, you will have nothing but fullness of joy. It's not what he said. <laughs> Jesus didn't say, wow, guys, be of good cheer. I run with the world. Jesus didn't say that. He didn't say, guys, have the fullness of joy at all times and be of good cheer for I look just like the world. He didn't say that. He said, I overcame the world. In the Bible, in the book of Revelation, it says to he who over, it doesn't say to he who's overcome. It says to he who overcomes. Well, how can I be an overcomer? How can I be more than a conqueror? How can I live in a place where all this stuff, I don't know if you've ever watched YouTube, probably have, but like you can watch a good video and there's like 10 more that are really bad about the heretic, about this, about the charlatan, about that. I can't afford to let that stuff affect me. Listen, if you're not hated for what you preach, you're probably going the same direction devils are. If you're not hated for your life, you're probably like, you're probably not preaching the original gospel. You're probably not. If I need you to like me, it's because I don't know I'm loved. If I need you to like me, I'm probably going to tell the things that, that are going to just build you up in a way, but never talk about the things that are going to actually shape you, form you, mold you, so that God can have access to the things that need to be cut away. Do you know that God still is like this amazing pruner? <laughs> Come on, man. I mean, this is painful. This is real. Like, all hell is on this earth through the enemy, but he tries to infiltrate the body of Christ and get into the minds, the mindset of the body of Christ to try to, to, try to get them to presume to all kinds of weird stuff. And then what happens is we pull back from one another, and that's not love. If God is love, then why can't we be? If God so loved the world that he gave, then why can't we give? <laughs> None of this. Ministry, ministry is not to be held tightly. God is to be held tightly. And everything else with a loose grip. <laughs> you are to hold on to God with everything that you are. You are to believe the Bible and what he says you are. You have to look into this word to find out who you truly are. And once you see that, you can't let the enemy take that. We grow up with the way that seems right to a man, and we grow that way, and we live that way, and our performance comes out of pleasing the way that seems right to people. And I can't afford to live and grow in a place that the way that seems right to a man. I can't even grow in the way that seems light to a brother, I have to grow in the way that is right to God. If it's not in here and God's not saying it, why would you want to go after it? Come on, guys. We live in a culture that's really crazy. It's called, let's sacrifice truth on the altar of being culturally relevant. Let's go where we feel good. Come on, man. 
Let's go where we feel good. Well, that person makes me upset. I'm just going to cut them off. I'm not going to talk to them anymore. I feel good again. That's not the gospel. Do you think that you're not going to answer for that when you stand before him? I'd rather answer now. See, because if I answer now when I stand before him, there's no junk in my closet. And is the life that you're living worth the price that he paid? Are you going after him? Are we going after him for just a stage? Are we going after him so that people can hear our music? Are we going after him so people can hear our preach? Are we going after him so people like our posts? Are we going after him because we love him with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength? And we love our neighbor as ourself. And the reason why we can't love our neighbor is because we don't know who we are because we build up this facade to make people think that we are somebody that we're not. <sighs> the original gospel. The one that sets you free from you so you can be free from others. The one that allows you to be so secure in here that when all hell breaks out, you're actually quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger because the anger of man doesn't promote the righteousness of God. And all of a sudden, behind this secret place, when everybody's not looking and they can assume, presume what they want, you're praying for those people that hurt you because you love them. And you're not offended. How do I keep my heart from offense? By lifting up prayer and blessing for everybody that's come against you. <laughs> do you think that Jesus' behemoth cries were just for his 12 disciples? It says that Jesus lifted up vehement cries to the Father. Do you think it was just for the disciples, just for Peter, just for those guys? Or do you think it was also for the Pharisees that hated him? That's right. Do you think it wasn't for everybody that despised him? And hey, Jesus Christ didn't do what he did just as God. He was fully man and fully God. But when he was here, he had to become man in order to fulfill the covenant that we had. He was fully God. He never stopped being God. It's, this is the weirdest thing. This is the one that brings the biggest persecution. If you're going to talk about the incarnation of Christ, you're going to get persecuted big time because most of the church is taught that Jesus is only God and he had nothing to do with humanity. But when you look at Philippians 2 and you see what Jesus truly did, Jesus humbled himself, became a bondservant, was tempted at all points, yet without sin. And you can't be tempted if you're doing it as God, because God cannot be tempted. If Jesus did what he did as God, then why did God need to anoint Jesus of Nazareth? God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing and healing all that were all if anybody had the right to be offended and hurt it would have been him think about this if anybody had the right to be offended wouldn't it have been jesus wouldn't jesus have been the biggest basket case the world has ever seen he's come to his own and they knew him not in him was the light of all men. In him was the light. And he came as the light to make us understand that he was representative of the Father so that one day when he went to be with the Father, we were going to become that light. And if you think that Jesus, look, Jesus didn't have it easy. He had it really intense. I mean, think about that. He's with God, always with God, always was. He never, ever was apart from him. And then for a season, he comes here, humbles himself as a bondservant. He becomes a little baby, goes into a mom's womb as a fetus, bakes in the oven for nine months, and then comes out, Wah! just like us. It's ridiculous. It's the biggest most amazing plan that the world has ever seen. And God's whole plan was redemption. And redemption doesn't just mean like I've been purchased. Redemption means being brought back to the original value that I had before we ever ate the tree. Jesus is going to do something that's absolutely so incredible. The world has never seen it. The devil couldn't see it. He didn't know it. Because if the powers and principalities would have known what they were doing, they would have never crucified Jesus. But they did. But did they crucify Jesus just to get you to heaven? Or did they crucify Jesus so that you could be forgiven and your sin could be removed? Listen, this is huge. Jesus is king. He's Lord of all. 
But Lord means master. And if you're in unforgiveness and you're offended, he's not your master. You are. It's not acceptable. It's not allowed. I don't care what your reasons are. None of them are going to fly. Jesus said that if I don't forgive, my father will not forgive me. People go, I'm already forgiven. Wrong. It's contingent on your forgiveness. People are like, that's not true. That's not the Bible. No, you don't read it. If you think you have the right to be hurt and offended and depressed and angry and bitter and everybody else, everybody else is wrong and you're right, you're not. You're in sin. You're, you're living a lie. And that lie will find you out and you'll never be happy. You'll never because your joy is contingent on somebody else being nice to you. It's not about people being nice for you. It's about Jesus who came to die for you. When you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you to deliver you from that sin, to deliver you from your anger, from your bitterness, from your unforgiveness, from your depression. He didn't pay a price to just give you a nice life. He paid a price to give you an abundant life, but that abundant life is all inclusive on you believing the truth because then you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free because there's a thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And that right there is the definition of Christianity. If you believe the lies, the thief is coming to steal, kill, and destroy. You believe the lies, you empower the liar. And if you empower the liar, it's only a matter of time till you become a liar. Here's a liar. Hey, bro, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing good, man. That's awesome. That guy's a jerk. Oh, praise God. Praise God in worship. We love God all. Jesus, you're so amazing. Did you see that guy today? Man, he's, jeez. Yeah, I don't know what his deal is. You're a liar. This is no joke. This is for real. You think that we have time to play these games? Do you think that we have time to play these games and to harbor that stuff for a second? Do you think that we're not closer to his return than ever before? Do you see America? Do you see what it looks like? Do you see what the body of Christ looks like with its little riffs and its little this and its little that and my click and your click and their click and their ministry and my church and your church and we got our church and you got yours? That's sin and twistedness and it's a lack of unity. It's dysfunctional. And Jesus didn't pay a price for a dysfunctional church. He paid a price for a bride that would make herself ready. Do we have a reason to be offended? No, you don't. Unless you're taking stuff personal. And the truth is, is when you find out what God says about you, you will know what God thinks about others. People are like, man, Todd White, you're an evangelist. Dude, you, you always witness. Like You always share your faith. Why are you so bold? Here's why. I don't hold any unforgiveness. I don't hold any bitterness. I don't hold any judgment against people. I don't hold any hurt because of what people have said, because of what people have done. I believe the truth. I believe that Jesus Christ paid a price for me to be free from you because I'm free from me. You are not responsible for my walk. I am, and I will not jeopardize my walk with Jesus because one day I'm going to stand like you're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You think you're going to avoid it, but you're not. I promise you, it is awesome to live with a clean conscience with clean hands and a pure heart it is very demonic to lift your hands in praise but live with impurity inside of here the fire of his presence the beauty of his holiness he has called us to be holy and set apart he has called us by his name to represent his name. And representing his name means to represent Jesus to a lost and dying world. And the church is losing and dying and she needs to be triumphant and walking in total victory. I am not perfect, but I am in love. And when I'm convicted, I'm obedient. I will not deny obedience for a second because delayed obedience is disobedience. And you cannot live and walk with Jesus and say you love God and have that other junk inside of your life. 
Do you know that like the Holy Spirit, God, the whole, he's not a mist, he's not a vapor, and I know we know that. Do you know he told Peter, because he said to the guys, he goes, I'm going to go, I'm going to be crucified, and Peter messed it up and said, this will never happen to you, and Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, for your mind is full of the things of man and not the things of God. In other words, you're thinking like a mere man and thinking like a mere man is demonic. Let me tell you how much truth is in that statement. How many times has somebody done something that you cannot believe that was possible? You couldn't believe it, and then they stayed in it, and they didn't repent, and they stayed in that place. And you're sitting there going, what is happening? I cannot believe it. Just because they're deceived doesn't mean you have to live there. Just because someone's deceived, because they're broken, they're hurting, usually it comes because the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God. There are two different kinds of wisdom. You got the wisdom of man, which is sensual and demonic. It's in James. It's full of self-seeking and envy, and everything evil is there. It doesn't say some evil things are there. I need you to get this really, really important. It's so important. We've got to come to the truth and reality that our war is not against flesh and blood backbone of this whole message is that our war is not against flesh and blood. It is against principalities, powers, spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Our war is never against people, what they've said, what they've done, how they've said they're sorry. If they didn't say they're sorry, if they repented, if they didn't repent, your repentance isn't dependent on someone else's. And if you are waiting for them to say you're sorry to you, it's not the Lord. It's your personal emotional brokenness. If I need somebody to save face and say, listen, I really messed up, man. I I just, yeah, that's what Jesus needed from you. That's what he needed from you. I mean, he, you know, he died knowing that if I do this, I know they're going to say sorry. <sighs> Did Jesus pay a price on the cross because he knew that one day you were going to say, I'm sorry, Jesus. Do you think that's what love does? No, because love keeps no record of wrongs. This is a pretty big deal. I mean, how many times? I mean, I'm, I'm looking around the room. L all of you have been through this. Lots of you have been through this with me. You've been through this with William and me in our stuff that we went through. None of you know the, the real story, but I love this man with all my heart, with all my soul, all my strength. I do. I love Costi. I love David Wally. He was my first intern. David Wally. I just want to say some things. David Wally is one of the most pure people I've ever met in my life. Ever. But David Wally, one time. One time, I'm just going to share. David Wally, he's like a spider monkey. No, no, no. If you've ever seen him climb, you've never seen him. Like, I don't know. He's like one of those guys you see on the cliff, like holding on with one hand. But David can do the flagpole thing where he holds sideways. I, I would break my arms trying to do a flagpole. There's too much weight going down. But Dave, we're, we are at, we are in Paris. I just, I want to lighten it up a little bit with a couple of jokes, okay? And then I'm going to dig into your heart again. Because I love Jesus. I'm not... I'm not trying to like, uh, look, I don't, have a, I don't have a point to prove. I just want to see us all be pure in heart and really, uh, uh, look, I watched your worship. It's amazing. But if you got junk in your closet, get it out because it's trash and it's killing you. It's hurting you. It's hurting your kids. You're demonstrating unforgiveness for your children. And then you're going to want them to love God. I don't think so, buddy. And we're like, God, you're, he is amazing. Yeah, but mom, you, you did this like your whole life. You're offended your whole life, and now you love God. I don't want this, Jesus. You don't think that's, you don't think that's there. I promise it's there. They're watching your every move. They want to know, do you really forgive? Is the gospel really that good? Do you really forgive your relatives, your friends? Be very careful about your little gossip tangent. Well, I don't like, you know, I, that's what he says, but... Uh, uh, Ooh, man. When you say that, you know what would be amazing? Is if you could picture Jesus sitting 
in front of you. We don't. We're not eternally minded. We're worldly minded. We think about things here. We're not thinking about things there. We say we do, but your speech, your unforgiveness, your bitterness, your anger, all that stuff demonstrates from what world you live in. So you can say what you want, but if that stuff's in your mouth and that stuff's in your heart, I'm telling you right now, you've given Jesus a little bit, but you've given the world a lot of you. Okay, back to David. Let's get happy. All right. So we were in Paris. Remember Paris, bro? We're there. We're going to film, and, and it's going to be awesome. I was doing the Jesus Culture Tour, the Fearless Tour. And David's there, and there's this stage, and, and you're, you've got to come down on a slant from the auditorium. You gotta, it's like a, a movie theater. Actually, it was more than a movie theater. It was the, it was the oldest cabaret which is a strip club, nightclub, in Paris, France. And so we're going to do the first Jesus event that's ever been done in the building. There are snipers on the roof. There is all kinds of crazy, ridiculous threats that are happening. And David and I walk in. Robert's with me, Gervais, he's filming. And David sees that stage and he goes, I could jump that. I go, bro, don't do it. I said, I'm telling you right now, man, it's not going to be good here. That's like six feet. He goes, I got this, bro. He runs full speed, man. I'm, I'm full speed down the auditorium. Jumps and shins. And slides down the wall. You remember? Big knobs on his shins. He goes, pray for me. I go, no, 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 not pray for you. Not praying for you. We prayed for him, but he was like, that really hurt. That really hurt. That really hurt. I go, bro, do it again. Do it again. <laughs> it was so fun. Oh, Jesus. Oh, well, William, we have so many things that I could talk about. So many. Remember when we were fasting and we were in the hotel? We were like, I was like fasting. We were fasting pretty intense. I go, let's run steps, bro. He's like, Really? <laughs> and we're running I think I don't know 13 flights or something like that we're cranking up the steps huh or, come on let's go let's go William <laughs> he's like dude this is stupid I got a headache <laughs> or Harry in Brazil the gym we were gonna go to the gym you know Harry's got arms like a he's like leg, legs for arms <laughs> Harry William's brother-in-law we, we're, we're in a hotel. We're going down to the gym because we're going to work out because I believe you should train. You should. You should take care of your temple. So we go down there and, and he goes, oh, bro, gym's closed. I go, it's all right, bro. We've got 30 flights of stairs. <laughs> Harry's like, no, dude. I said, Harry, if you're going to be my assistant. We're going to run. He goes, I said, are you, a, are you afraid? He goes, let's go. <laughs> it was the, one of the greatest days of my life. It was so fun. It's a lot of stairs to run. It was so good. I've got these memories. I've got these great memories. I've had other good memories with David. Remember the time when you took a $10,000 camera? Do you remember? $10,000. Oh, you remember. I'm going to bring it up right now because we laughed about it, but Robert wasn't laughing. So, so you know how you get on another flight, you go into another country, you get on another flight, and like you recheck your bags. So we rechecked our bags, but the camera was a carry-on. And so it wasn't a recheck your bag kind of thing. It didn't have a ticket on it. So we're getting ready to go through security. David's got the camera. David just throws it through the recheck bag thing. Boom, down the chute. We go through security. We're in there. Robert goes, David, where's the camera? He goes, I checked it. I went, oh. I, I don't get upset. I'm not going to get upset. Robert was like beside himself. He goes, David. David runs out. He goes, oh, go get it. He runs out through security. I don't know how we got it back, but it was mercy somehow. Out of all the luggage, we got our camera back. It was amazing. I've got all these memories, man. Then I've got the hard times. I've got hard stuff. I've got, man, we tried to do a church together, and, and I was like excited. And, and a lot of you, who, were, who was here when we did that? right? I'm excited. And then not, really, not many people understood what was happening, but, but man, we wanted this thing to work and we tried and, and your dad and, and Benny were like, if this works, it's going to be awesome. And we're trying. And I am not a pastor. I'm not. I'm an evangelist. If you're not living for God and you're not stepping out and touching people for your faith, I'm just not okay. I'm an evangelist. I'm an evangelist all the way through. I'm a prophetic evangelist that believes that all of us can hear God's voice. But 
an evangelist is to equip the saints for the works of ministry. What work of ministry? For you to be able to live your life out loud, but I'm also a teacher. I love teaching. But a pastor, a shepherd? No, that's not me. And I, I know now that that's not me. But I didn't know then, but I was trying. All I wanted to do was I wanted to have our encounter service like move to Sundays. And what do you do during COVID when you can't do anything? Like, come on, let's do this. God, I know you want to do this. And I really felt like the Lord was saying, do this on Sunday. So we tried and we did. And then when you came along, it was like rescue. I mean, you were like uh, filling in the gaps. I didn't know how to do this stuff. And so Jenny and Tanner and everybody's helping. And I'm like, wow. And then it got really hard really quick. It did. And it wasn't because I was in sin. It wasn't because William was in sin. It was just something where we weren't supposed to do this. And so what do you do? And then, I don't know if you guys remember, but like my heart got sick. I mean, it was really weird. It was 2021 and we're trying to work through this. And all of a sudden I get hit and my heart's at 20% ejection fraction overnight. So we did a power and love in Nashville. You guys okay? I'm just going to be real and raw with you. Because I love God, but we can't afford to think the wrong things. Presumption is sin. I don't know if you know that or not, but presuming something that you don't know to be true, but presuming it's true is sin, and you need to get free. Because what happens is it doesn't just stay there. It carries on to the next thing you're going to do. Then it carries on to the next thing. And then the next thing you're going to do. You'll have that presumption thing all the way through, and you will be like a rogue Somebody that doesn't really know God, but tries to plug in and be a part of a community, but there's no community in you. It's a big deal. Big deal. So I, I come home from Nashville from a power and love, and it was an amazing time. I'm talking like amazing time. I come home, I can hardly breathe, and my son-in-law says, hey, you need to go to the hospital. I'm like, dude, I, I don't know what this is. I think I'm just like, my lungs just feel congested. He goes, you need to go. You can hardly breathe. So I went to the hospital. I go to the doctors and the doctor like didn't say anything until the next day. I was a pin cushion overnight. But the next morning, my wife comes in at 9 a.m. She's coming in to, to hang with me. The doctor, the heart doctor comes in at the same time. And the heart doctor says, Mr. White, we figured out what's wrong with you. It's your heart and you could die any moment. That's what he says to my wife. I'm like, that's not okay, pal. Like, this is my wife. He goes, well, it's the truth. I said, no, let me tell you the truth. Yeah. And it was intense. It was an intense time. And it wasn't okay. And like, she's going, this is my wife. Like, the one that I give my testimony about every day of my life, four or five times a day. This is the love of my life. This is one flesh, been together 28 years, married 19 <laughs> now. This is her. And she is faced with with logical facts that her husband might die. So what do you do with that? How do you process that as the wife of somebody that's gotten hit with sickness, that's heart is now like out of nowhere. I eat healthy. I, I mean, I don't eat junk. I'm not a junk food guy. I'm a, I'm a keto guy. If I put my mind to something, I'm going to go after it. And sure enough, man, the doctor's like, you know, your heart's at 20% ejection fraction. You could die at any moment. I said, what is that even ejection fraction? He goes, that is the pumping capacity of your heart. The reason why you've gained like 30 pounds in water weight is that your, pump, your pump's not working. Your heart's like a sump pump. It gets water out, fluid. I go, well, what do I do? He goes, well, we're going to put you on 14 medicines. Never taken medication in my life, only vitamins and stuff like that. But now I'm going to be on 14 medicines, amiodarone, uh, blood pressure medication, blood thinner medication, you name it. I'm on it now. And it's not good. And I'd go home from this hospital like five days later. I'm in for over, was it Christmas? Thanksgiving? Yeah. Thanksgiving. I come, I come home and now I'm like bedridden. And we were already having struggles and trying to get things together. And now I'm out of the equation and William's doing an amazing job. But I'm, I can't even help. And I went home and people are praying for me. But man, you, I want you to think about this. You know, you, with me, as far as like the ministry goes, I believe this is God. We're supposed to come together. We would have never said, let's become one. Let's do this together unless I believed it was from God. I didn't know how hard it was going to be. I didn't know what was involved in that. Are you with me? It was hard. And I'm like, we're going to make this work because we committed to this. And you know, I, for me, it's a covenant thing. I don't want to break that thing. And so we're going after it. William's praying for me. I'm hurting. 
and I'm on all this medication that's putting me in la-la land. At the same time, two weeks into this heart thing, my wife gets hit with this severe pain in her abdominal area. So we go to the hospital. Here she's got multiple tumors in her uterus. Out of nowhere, never had pain before. Just like that. Is this like coincidence? Is it coincidence? Is it just a coincidence that like my heart is like almost dead? The doctor said, is it a coincidence that my wife has multiple tumors and needs an emergency hysterectomy? Is it coincidence? Or is there a demonic realm that is pressing in from the outside trying to get in here? This is no joke. Guys, if you realize this, principalities are constantly on you, aggressively towards you, and trying to twist and contort the way that you think on a continual basis because they know that if they can twist this, they can get you to fake worship here and think like hell here. It doesn't stop until you see their game. When you see their game, when you know what they're doing, when you understand the real war, that your war is not against flesh and blood, that your war is not against the person that's saying something wrong, your, the war is not against a best friend that was your best friend forever and turned their back on you just for selfish reason. Wisdom of the world, sensual, demonic, full of envy, listen to this, full of envy and self seeking. I need you to picture this. It's sensual. It's demonic. It's led by feelings. It's feeling oriented. How do I feel? How do you make me feel? It's sensual and demonic. What does demonic mean? It is ruled by the demonic realm. Satan is still the principality of the air. He is still the God of this world. We don't see him, but we need to know his scandals, his craftiness. Watch this. Satan prowls around like a roaring lion with no teeth, looking for whom he can devour. And all you need to do is stray in your soul a little bit, start to believe the way that seems right to a man, and you've allowed the root of everything evil to twist you. Money, the love of money is the root of all evil, but the wisdom of man is the root of all evil. I want you to hear this. This is so big. Listen to this over and over and over and over and over again. There was a movie that was out a little while ago. It was called Nefarious. You can get it on Amazon Prime. Did you guys, did anybody see it? Let me just explain something to you about this movie. I went, I made my daughters go. My wife was like, we're not going. It's a rated R movie. I'm like, we're going. Because I knew who made it. There were two priests that made this movie. And it's a movie about the demonic realm and the God realm. But it's a movie about this guy that's in prison. His name is not Nefarious. His name is Edward. But Edward is possessed by a devil named Nefarious. So this worldly psychologist comes in, this atheist psychologist comes in to interview him because he needs to judge or see whether he is fit to face the execution chair, which is at 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock at night. He goes in in the morning and he said he's going to do this evaluation to judge whether he's sane or insane. Because if he's insane, he doesn't get the chair. If he's sane, he gets the chair. So he goes in to interview this guy. The last psychologist that this guy Edward had actually threw himself off a 20-story building and killed himself because nefarious drove him crazy. So this new psychologist comes in. He's got money. He's a wealthy guy. He comes in and he's like, hi, my name's so-and-so. And he goes, how you doing, Edward? He goes, you're not talking to Edward. You're talking to Nefarious. And it's, it's dark. It is. But the problem is, is we think everything's nicey nice. We think everything's, woo, everything's good. Well, chill. Woo, that hurt a little. I don't know what that was. It was a devil. <laughs> no, we don't think that way. We're saying, like, yeah, well, you know, they should, you know, I don't, I don't appreciate the way they talk to me right there. It was demonic. No, no, no. It's a person. No, no, no. The way that seems right to a man. Listen to me. If you get this right now, you will never be offended again. You'll never be hurt by people again. You'll hurt four people instead of being hurt by people. Well, it's a difference being hurt, hurting for somebody than being hurt by them. If you're hurt by them, they're your Lord and your leader and your master and Jesus isn't. If you hurt for them, Jesus has become Lord and master of your soul. This is not incorporate Jesus time, guys. 
This is full on surrender. I'm going to believe what this Bible says. I believe that my war is not against flesh and blood. Another scripture. Therefore, we now, therefore, regard nobody according to the flesh. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. What does that mean? It means I don't have the right to seek hosty for whatever Costi says, whatever Costi does, apart from the gospel, I only have the right to see him for his creative value and the plans that God has for him. I can't afford to see him anything less because if I do, I'm, I'm looking at him according to the flesh. So this guy, Nefarious, is going through this conversation with this psychologist, psychologist and atheist. He doesn't believe. He goes, I don't believe in demons. And uh, this guy is like, Nefarious is like talking to him, but it's really cool because he is giving him the lowdown on the demonic realm and the plans of the enemy. He calls the enemy the master. He calls God the enemy. And he calls Jesus that carpenter. It was funny. This priest, this Catholic priest comes in. He's like this guy and he goes, have you come to torment me? This demon says. He goes, I don't believe in that. He goes, oh, you're an imposter. I'm like, oh my God, dude, are you kidding me? Like, if he knew who God was, he'd cast that thing out. And Edward, well, he committed a whole bunch of murders. So, but the whole movie is about this war that I'm talking about right now that the body of Christ doesn't even believe. I mean, we say we we'll believe it, yet you'd be offended. I don't think you believe anything. I'm not, listen, if the shoe fits, kick it off because it's not supposed to be your shoe. Your shoe is supposed to be the gospel of peace shod with peace people are like well what what like this is all weird to me i know but when you get born again you get born into this world this this new world this world of the kingdom to where the kingdom of god come on guys it's a completely different world my war is not against people in this in this movie it's crazy you should see it just so you could see, you should see the reality. It was funny because we get to the end of the movie and I'm not going to tell you the end. You want to see it. It's really, really good. And then we get to the end and we walk out and this girl comes out. And she goes, that was the most stupid thing I ever saw. Like God and Jesus and, and, and all that stuff. And she's telling me. And I go, oh. I said, wow. I said, that's awesome. I said, so you don't believe any of this? She goes, no, it's so stupid. I came here to see a horror movie. I said, well, you know what is really crazy is the truth is horror. She goes, what do you mean truth? I said, oh, and I shared my testimony. And she's like this. She's backing up. I go, what's wrong with you? And I'm walking towards her. She goes, I don't know. This is so weird. I go, no, no, no. I said, you have people in your life that are just like how I used to be. I said, but Jesus set me free, see? And I said, I had demon stuff in my life. But God went and took them all away. I was worse than that guy you saw, although I didn't commit the same crime. The heinous lifestyle of twistedness and arrogance and pornography and drugs and alcohol and all the stuff that goes with it, all the hatred, all the anger, all that stuff that you want to be free from. She's looking at me. I, I said, you know what? I said, that movie's true. She goes, I'm out of here. She ran. I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't talk to her. She ran into the right guy, though. She could have ran into someone else. Yeah, it was stupid, right? So I'm, I'm really sick in this place, really sick in the hosp uh, you know, at home, but on 14 meds, I'm bedridden. My brain is so foggy. I felt high again, and I, I hate the feeling of anything taking over this because I want to be clear and concise, sharp. I want to be sharp and aware because there are so many lies, and God gives you sharpness so that you can be aware and have a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him so that you can be aware of the tactics of the enemy at all times. Yes. He gives you sharpness and awareness, but he expects you actually to search this word. It's the glory of God to conceal things in the word, but it's the glory of kings to search it out. He's given us the ability to search and mine for gold. But we are so busy reading books about the Bible that we hardly ever get into the actual Bible itself. Because we believe that we can't hear. And the only reason you can't hear is because you're not diligent to go after him. Because God says that he's a diligent rewarder of them that seek him. Do you seek him? Do you seek him for what he says about you? Do you seek him for what he has for you? Do you seek him for who he is as a father? 
or do you seek other stuff trying to roundabout way? You're just going to become an echo and you'll never be a voice. Come on. It's not okay to not know him. It's one thing to have an encounter with him. It's another thing to host him. Because if you don't host him, you're hosting the devil. If you don't host God, you're hosting the demonic. And I'm not saying you're possessed. I'm saying that I have seen so much oppression because of people hosting the demonic realm through their mind, will, and emotions and allowing this thing that could be a pure, unadulterated filter, filter absolutely cleansed from all junk, all yuck, making sure that you're caught because your conscience is your filter. Your conscience, your mind, your will, your emotions, your soul. God has given us the ability to live and walk with a clean conscience and anything that violates it must be forsook. Anything that violates your conscience must be forsook or else you cannot live the pure life that God wants you to live. I cannot allow anything that is violating my conscience to remain. If I do, what happens is your conscience becomes seared and you will allow sin in your life, unforgiveness in your life, and you will have this form of godliness denying the power thereof. And you can come to church and you can sing well. You can move in a gift. And I'm not talking about anybody specifically, so please don't hear me that way. Gosh, the enemy is so crafty, man. You can sing an amazing song and worship and have other people cry, but you can, you can be singing that just so that people can hear you sing. You can be dancing for the Lord and, 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 and want to glorify the Lord, but really you just want people to like your dance. Are you guys with me? This has nothing to do with pointing the finger at anybody. I'm just telling you that we should live every moment to live to please the Lord in everything that I do. Colossians 3.17 is one of my life scriptures. It says, whatever I do, whether in word or in deed, I'm going to do it as unto the Lord and not for people. Yes, I might be doing something for a person, but I stand before an audience of one and I want to love God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind and my strength. And I want to love my neighbor as myself. And I want to live by those two commandments every second of every day. And when you start to let your conscience become defiled, you will stop loving your neighbor. And it is only to pinpoint you not really loving God. You all right? I know it's quiet. I know this is painful stuff. It's good because if we rip this thing out, imagine if, do you remember when you first got saved? Remember when, remember when you first said yes to Jesus? Remember when you were like, oh my God, you're real? Do you remember that? Do you remember when you, when you were so excited that, oh my God, he's real? Do you remember that? The only way to maintain that is a clear conscience. If you let your conscience become defiled, you shipwreck your faith. But it's not just faith to go to heaven. It's faith to have intimacy with God. Oh, if I don't keep my conscience clean, I can't have face-to-face -face communion with him. If I don't keep this thing clean, I can't have a relationship with him. I can know about him, and I can still preach, and I can still teach, and I got gifts. I can still pray for the sick. The sick can be, I can still got it. I still got words of knowledge, the gifts and callings of God, or without repentance. I'm not required to repent to walk in a gift. The only way that I can actually bear fruit for God, see, gifts are given, but fruit is grown. <laughs> fruit is grown. And you know what really helps you grow fruit? Being really squeezed like crazy from every direction. <laughs> where you're like, what is happening right now? Oh, God, have your way in me. <laughs> and not going they, him, her. Ha, ha. Because the more I do this, the less I see this. <clears throat> All that stuff. Man, God says he'll never allow you to go through something that you're not equipped to stand underneath of. That's what it says. Woo, I'm really emotional right now because I love him. All he wants is for us to really 
be as free as we sing we are. He just wants us to be free. He wants us to let all that stuff go because it's stuff. That stuff is hurting you. That stuff can't afford to bring stuff in. The stuff hurts us. God's amazing. He's everything. Sometimes people are angry at God because they allow, because God allowed this. What would you, I don't know yet, but you're sovereign. No, stop it. Stop saying that God allow, that God allow, that God allow. Take that out of the equation. If it's the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy, understand that Satan doesn't need permission to attack you. <laughs> That'll clear up a lot of stuff in your life right away. It will. Satan doesn't. We look at Job and we're like, yeah, well, God, I mean, Satan came before Job. I mean, he asked God. No, no, no. God pointed Satan out, pointed Job out to Satan. What do you think about that? Satan didn't go, let me get Job. No, no, no. God started it. <laughs> do you understand that? That's the craziest story. I mean, it said Satan came to present himself with the sons uh, with, uh, in front of God. William, don't leave yet. <laughs> we'll just wait. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I love him. But look, Job comes before God, and God says, I want you to, I want you to think with me right now. God says to, Job, or, or God says to the enemy, now, do you, do you understand? First, before we even say this part, do you realize that God knows all things? Do you think God didn't understand? Do you think God didn't know? When God asks a question, it's not like he doesn't know. Are you with me? If God says, like, you look at Job, like, Job 29 through 31. You look at all these hundred and some questions that God asked Job. Do you think God didn't know the answers? No, no, no. He's all knowing. He's all powerful. He's, he's, he's God. So he says to the devil, from where do you come? Why did he say that? Think with me. He said, from where do you come? What? Because he's reminding the devil of his big mess up. <laughs> the devil says, from walking to and fro on the earth. Why? Because God put him here. Yeah. Do you understand? God's not like, from where do you come? I haven't seen you in a long time, and you've been hiding, and I don't understand. I mean, Satan, please fill me in here. Sometimes we're not looking at this. I'm looking at this. I'm like, whoa. Like, he's reminding Lucifer, he's reminding the devil of his big mess up in heaven where Satan tried to elevate himself above God and he got cast down here to earth. And then when he was here, God put man on the earth after the devil was here. <laughs> this is so good. Listen, this is amazing. Guys, like the earth was without form and void. Are you with me? And then God, boom. The devil was already kicked out. Him and a third that followed him were here. They were already here. So God put Adam and Eve on the earth. Why? To have dominion. To be fruitful and to multiply and to subdue the earth because outside of that garden was mayhem and twistedness. So God created one in his image because he wanted the devil destroyed by one in his image. Come on. And then all of a sudden, like, they didn't do well. They obeyed the voice of another, and the keys to dominion and authority were handed to the enemy. The serpent deceiving. Are you with me? Follow me here. And then you see, now, when you fast forward to Jesus in Luke 4, Luke 4, Jesus is tempted. He's out in the wilderness being tempted. We're going to go back to Job in a second. But I just want you to understand that this is what God has desired from the beginning. God has desired that people in his image would thump the enemy and not be threatened by the enemy in any way, shape, or form and never turn around and curse God. Are you with me? So Jesus in Luke 4 is, is tempted by the enemy. The first temptation is, if you really are the son, then change these stones into bread. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from God. Why? Because it's written in Scripture in Deuteronomy. And also, when God said to Jesus, you are my beloved son, and whom I'm well pleased, Jesus just heard the Father say that. 
Why? Because righteousness was attained and Jesus heard the Father say, you're my son. That would help all of us because if all of us can understand what righteousness means, you get to hear the Father saying that I am your father, you are my son, you're my daughter in whom we're well pleased. Like this is a big deal. So Jesus is then taped to, take up to, took up to a high place and, he's, and the devil shows him all these kingdoms of the world. And he said, all these kingdoms and their dominion, they have been delivered to me so I can give them to whoever I wish if you just bow down and worship me. What Satan was saying is in the garden, one just like you gave me these keys. Here's the keys. If you bow down and worship, they can be yours. Jesus didn't come to bow except to God and he came to die so that we might live so that all of us could have dominion over the enemy. Okay. So God's original purpose and plan for men was that we have dominion. You can't have dominion if you have offense. So Job, look at this. Satan is talking to God. This is when, when he comes before God and he says, and God says, this is amazing. This is what I want. God says, Satan, have you seen William? <laughs> have you seen William? He will, he's one that loves me and hates you. He despises evil and loves good. Have you considered my friend? Have you considered? Look, how many of you would like God to say that? Maybe not in that case. I mean, maybe not. No, but I'm telling you right now, what do you think the, the enemy is called the accuser? What do you think he does? Do you think he accuses you? What if God could point you out and say, this is my servant. This is Costi. He loves me and he despises you. What are you blessed? The only reason Costi loves you is because of what you give him. You, the only reason Costi loves you is because you gave him a church, you gave him a car, gave him a house, gave him a wife, gave him kids. The only reason he really loves you is because of what you've blessed him with. They don't really love you. They're selfish just like me. Now, I'm telling you, the enemy is this right here. He says, take what Costi has away and Costi will curse you. Do you think the enemy's not doing that to all of us? Do you think that the accuser is not on the same point? Do you think, watch, what is the enemy saying? They are selfish just like me. The only reason they love you is because of what you give them. Because they're not after you for you. They don't love you. They just want your blessing. They just want your stuff. They just want your gifts. Just take their gifts, take their stuff away, and they'll curse you. Watch. And he's been doing it to everyone. Come on, we look at the story, and then all of a sudden the enemy attacks. And then servants come in. Oh my gosh, Job, we, were, we saw the fire of God fall. Was it God's fire? Did God get blamed? Think with me. How many people have gone through stuff and said, well, God allowed, well, God did, well, God did that. No, 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 if it's the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy, let's not blame God. Let's realize who it is. Let's worship God and love God and realize that God has nothing to do with it. Yeah, but he, if he loved me, he could have stopped it. No, if you loved him, you could have surrendered. This is no joke. I was going through it. Man, my heart was dying. I was on 14 meds. I couldn't even hardly breathe. My wife has her hand above my nose to see if I'm breathing every night. My kids were coming to me, Dad, I'm so sorry. It's not your fault, baby. Let's just pray. And then I'm trying to read my Bible, and because of the drugs, I'd fall asleep very quickly. I could hardly read. I could hardly, no length of time, just out. So for three, two months, I am incapacitated in my prayer chair, sleeping for 18 hours a day in my bed and in my chair, useful for nothing. And thank God William was taking care of stuff because I could have never done it. Thank God. And I'm like, I'm behind the scenes, can't do anything. The enemy was coming at me in a million different ways, a million different ways. The only thing that I had, the only thing I had in that season was my memory of the truth that I'd already put in my heart. <laughs> I didn't have fresh revelation because I couldn't read. I'd fall asleep every time I read I try to listen to the audio Bible, and in four or five minutes, I'm out cold. And the Bible's still playing, so maybe my brain's hearing it, but my, I'm just in la-la land. felt like I was high. And now I got my wife that's sick. Now she's in bed. 
Then we go back to the doctors and they said, well, you had cancer in one of your tumors. So now we have to go to a cancer doctor. All at the same time. Woo, 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 woo. And it looks like everything is falling. What do I do? What do I do? How do I, how do I recover from this? What do I do? See, no one knows that stuff. God does. I didn't curse William. I didn't curse people. I didn't, my closet, I can't believe, I can't believe. I go, oh my God. And all these people are saying, and look, and know, and then people are, oh my gosh. And you have these people on YouTube. Healer, heal yourself. Todd White, heart condition, all that stuff. And they're like, oh, if he could heal, then why wouldn't it? All of it. <laughs> One thing after another. It's just horrible stuff. Really. And 60 days in, I'm like, I go back to the doctor and he says, you know, your heart has only recovered the 32% from 20 and you need to get a defibrillator put in your chest. And the only option is for you to get a defibrillator because if you don't get this put in, you're going to die. You cannot live this way. I mean, they wanted me to wear a life vest, one of those defibrillator vests where it's like, it was so expensive and we have a program that's, it's not a, it's not like medic. It's not like a medical program. It's called Samaritan where you, where you, it's a Christian co-share, but they weren't covering. And I'm like, I'm not doing this. I'm not going to wear the vest. So that's what scared her for the first 30 days. I wasn't wearing a vest. I wasn't going to put a vest on. And if my heart goes out, it shocks me. Like, I just, no, I'm not doing it. Like, just not like I have to have some kind of faith here, you know, taking meds. I'm like, I don't, I hate medication. So I'm like, I, I love supplements and stuff that makes you healthy, but I'm not, I hate it. So I'm taking this and I'm like, wow. you know, I told the doctor, you know what, dude? I'm like, I'm done. He goes, what do you mean you're done? He goes, we're just beginning. I said, no, well, I'm done. Dude, I'm not taking your medicines anymore. I feel like I'm high again. I hate it. He goes, they're just relaxing your heart. They're just vitamins for the heart. I said, no, dude. Have you read amiodarone is the most toxic heart medication? You've had me on it for 60 days straight. The max people go on it is four weeks. I've been on it for eight. And it, the side effects are, are horrible. I'm like, it's like, I'm not doing it. I'm done. He's like, if you take these away, you will die. I said, you aren't allowed to tell me when I'm going to die. I said, man, I said, look, I appreciate you. You know, firemen come, and when there's a fire, they put out the fire, but they don't rebuild the house. And I said, I love that you put out the fire but the Lord's going to build this house. And he's like, you and the Lord, like you and this Lord, I'm a Christian just like you. I said, no. I said, you go to church to please your wife. And I'm not mad. I wasn't being mean because he told me my wife and I go to church. My wife, she's been to church. I go to church with her. We're a certain denomination. I'm like, you know what? You don't go because you know God. Like I freak you out. I'm praying for your nurses and you're frustrated. You're like, well, yeah, well, like, you know, you cause a ruckus. I'm like, no, I believe in God, the kingdom. I said, I want to pray with you. When I get healed, you will go with me to an event and watch this happen. And he said, he goes, yeah, if you ever got healed from this, I would go. I said, all right, because I'm coming off of all your medicines. All 14 of them, cold turkey, tomorrow's my first day, no more medicine. And I'm going to do a 40 day water fast and I'm going to see what God has to say about this. And he's like, Mr. White, you will die. Did you tell your wife? I said, my wife absolutely loves God, dude. She's watching these medicines kill me. Like, you're killing me. He's like, we're helping you. I said, you've told me now I have to be on medicine, seven medica six to seven medications for the rest of my life. That sounds like you wanting to be Lord in my life. That's not happening. He goes, I am a doctor. I said, I understand. You're a Christian in your heart, but you're an atheist in your mind, and I can't live that way. God wants every part of us, spirit, soul, and body. Your soul is your mind, will, and emotions. If you would surrender and submit, if you would just give your heart to Jesus. I already did that. We're done here. You do what you need to do. I said, I'm going to. I love you. Bless you. I always told him I love him. I would hug him every time. He's frustrated with me. I'm in a hospital with sick people. I'm going to pray for people. So I left on this journey. And it was a really intense journey. And she, my wife was really concerned because I'm coming off of 14 meds, cold turkey. And I'm going to do a 40-day water fast. Water fast. Water fast. And I did. I did a week. I lived. I did another week. I lived. 
It was week to week. Ask her. I did another week. I lived. But my mind was back immediately. In, in like four days, my mind was clarity again. And I saw what was happening. And I saw what was happening with the church. And I saw what William was doing. And it hurt because I wanted to be a part of everything. And I'm like, I know I'm not a pastor. And I know he's the man for this. He's the pastor. And I'm like processing with my wife. We're trying to figure out what are we to do? How are we to do this? I mean, it has been, since we got that building, it has been a real war. I don't know, like not a little war. I'm talking like, holy mackerel, dude. Kidding me. This is serious. But what do I do in all that? Do I keep my physical heart and keep my spiritual heart in a place of love? in a place of not being offended, in a place of not being hurt? Or do I let this thing get messed up spiritually but get healed physically and then let this thing get jacked up spiritually so that all of a sudden physically my whole life is out of whack? It's a big deal. So three weeks went by, feeling pretty good, not dead yet, watching, watching William, watching what he's doing, seeing what's happening talking through this stuff, trying to figure out what to do. And then again, another, and then again, another, and I'm still alive. I'm two months into this thing, like still alive, month and a half in this thing, like I did a 40-day water fast and I'm feeling really good. I'm like, I'm exercising again. I'm going to the gym, and, which was scary for everybody, but I'm going and I'm, I'm working out. I'm, I'm going after, after God, loving Jesus in my prayer closet, loving God. Come back, and I'm like, dude, like, you need to take this thing. Hard decision because I really wanted a whole building of people that were active, going out there, going out there and winning souls, man. Just, I believe that all of us, none of you have the permission to not be a witness. Are you with me? None of you have the permission to not be a witness. None of you. Well, I'm not an evangelist and I just want to go to church. No, be the church. None of us have permission to not witness the gospel, not witness for Jesus. All of us have the ability to be able to share our faith. Come on. So we, so we went and announced, and I came and said, you know what, I'm, I'm giving, and this was intense. We had lots of conversations, bro, intense ones for me. But God weathered through it all, and what needed to happen, happened, which is amazing. We didn't go public like weirdness because it wasn't a split. It was something where it wasn't for me to continue. And, I, and we did it. And at first, and a lot of you were involved in that. I mean, how many of you had hurt? How many of you? Like, raise your hands. It hurt? Heck yeah. It hurt me worse. <laughs> you have no idea. But what I learned is that I love William. <laughs> and I love God. And I don't want to do something that I'm not called to. I want to be who God created me to be. And I need William and Emily and the kids and Costi to run in the place and in the lane that they're called to run. And I don't want to be an interruption. I want to be a blessing. And I want to, I want to go after God with everything. I went back to the doctor. She went back, went back. The doctor said all the cancer was contained in the uterus. They got it all. So she was cleared, which is amazing. <laughs> And I went back to the doctor and I was completely cleared with my heart at 72%. 65 is what it's normal. So I was above that with an echo. I was cleared and my heart was completely healed, 100%. And the doctor wanted nothing to do with me. So, all right, you take care. <laughs> well, you're coming to an event, right? Well, you know. Uh... But who are you? Who are you? When you get squeezed, I always use this, and I heard Dan Moeller share it. When you squeeze an orange, you get orange juice. And when you squeeze an apple, you get apple juice. But it would be really strange when you squeezed an orange into a cup and it was apple juice. Because that fruit produces that juice. So when you're squeezed, does Jesus come out? I don't know if you know it or not, but you're going to be squeezed. <laughs> Are you, are you hearing me? Yeah. I don't know anybody that's not squeezed. There's people that avoid the squeeze, like, ah, ah. I sound like Elf a little bit, then. That's not good. <laughs> Sorry. Ah. 
sorry. I just want to lighten it up a little. But the truth is, is you're going to get squeezed. You got to. Who do you manifest when it happens? And you know, when you get faced with what I got faced with, and you can't read, and you can hardly listen, without having the truth of who God's created me to be tucked in here, I would have had nothing to work with. And I would have let the demonic realm whisper to me, well, William's really doing this. Well, you know, that's what they're saying, but he's really after this. He really doesn't love you. He just wants to be a preacher. He just wants to take over. He's trying to take everything. Think that that's not real. not okay to believe that stuff. This is real. The enemy's a liar. He comes with the worst things. He says the worst things at the right time. He is crafty. He's not stupid. Crafty and stupid are different. We get stuck on stupid for believing his craftiness. I can't afford to live in that place. I can't afford to presume things about William. I can't afford to presume things about Costi. I can't afford to presume things even about people that are vocally talking about hating me. I have to see them through the eyes of Jesus. I have to see them for who God says they are. I have to say, God, this is who you say they are. I have to. Hey, we have communion in here still. Can we do it? Can I have one? Oh, I love it so much. God. <laughs> thanks for coming, Elsie. Thanks for teaching. Thanks for doing it, bro. Thanks for... Thank you. Thank you. Does everybody have this? Oh, man, I love Jesus, buddy. This Christian life is hard. It is hard. Don't fake it like it's not. Because if you're living according to this book, apart from the way you feel, it is intense. If you're living according to the truth of what Scripture says about people, if you're living in a place where you're not allowing personal offense to come into you, if you're living in a place where you're not allowing somebody's sin against you to produce sin within you, if you're living in a place where you absolutely want to love biblically and keep no record of wrongs, if you want to live in that place, the only way to do it is by believing, b- believing the truth. And this truth is real. The enemy is after your truth. He's after your truth. He's after you having, coming up with a new truth. He doesn't want you to ever believe the original truth, the original gospel that God so loved the world that he gave his only beloved son, that whoever would believe in him wouldn't perish, but would have eternal life. The original truth is that Jesus paid a price so that we wouldn't perish. That's not just go to hell. That word perish is demonic strategy to get you to think like hell also. He paid, a pr- he paid a price for us to be completely transformed by the renewing of our minds so we could prove God's will, but he paid a price for us to have prosperity of soul. In 1 John 3, he says, I desire that you be in good health and prosper even as your soul prospers. (laughs) Wait a minute. My health is contingent on this? You better believe it. You better believe it, man. I'm telling you right now, there are so many diseases and sicknesses that are out there that are absolutely the byproduct of unforgiveness and hate. And all that offense and all that stuff. And if you get free, this is a big deal. You know, 
When I look at that meal, when I look at the, the communion meal, the communion elements, I mean, it's super powerful because we did this at my house even on, on New Year's. We took communion. I, I take communion pretty regularly, and the people that hate me, I actually look at the bread and I bless them. <laughs> Why? Because they're part of the body of Christ, and I can't afford to not discern the Lord's body when I take of this cup and eat of this bread. See, what we don't understand is it says, many of you have become sick and fallen asleep because you haven't discerned the body. Know what it means? It means that this meal that you're about to take has the ability to kill you or heal you. <laughs> Communion is the only meal that kills. Well, why? I, I, you know, it's kind of heavy, dude. It's like the body and blood of Jesus just... Just go, just get that little saying thing done. Like, this is the body, it was broken for you. Take and eat this, remember me. I hope it's a little more than just a nasty tasting piece of bread and some grape juice. I don't care what kind of bread you got. Unless it's fawful loaf, it tastes nasty. It tastes like cardboard. Do you ever have the big wafers? You don't know whether to chew it or let it melt. Uh, let's be real here. It's disgusting. It's real. But it's not what it looks like or what it tastes like. It's what it's done. And he says, every time you partake of this, remember. Well, if he wants us to remember every time we partake of this, we better do it often. And not just corporately, but privately. But don't do this unless you really in your heart are free from the stuff we've been talking about because this stuff right here is not okay because you're taking this haphazardly and that's what kills. People say, well, you know, I'm working on it. No, you're in unforgiveness. I, I, I need you to hear that. Some people are like, well, you know, it's, it's, it's a process. No, it's not. Either do it or live in sin. It's not that easy. No, you're making it really complicated. Jesus made it really easy. He took a seriously hard road for you to enter into the simplicity of the gospel. And if you enter into simplicity and you stay there, you'll never complicate this. I mean, how many of you would like to go back to the very first day that you met Jesus? Do you remember the joy that you had? Do you remember what happened when you, oh, no, you were like so excited. You're like, oh my God, I remember. It's never left me. That's my problem. When you look at the book of Revelation, you got this, you got, he's talking about the church in Ephesus, and this is like no other church on the planet, man. Like, these guys were amazing. I mean, it's the, the very place they had the biggest witchcraft book burning bonfire, it was the biggest revival. It's like $100,000 worth of witchcraft items being burned in the square. Like, and now it's in Turkey, and it's not even, it's, it's just crazy, this reality. But man, he says this, what Jesus said, you've done this well, you've done this well, you've done this well, this is amazing, you've done this, this one thing, this one thing I have against you. I don't want one thing he has against me. I don't know about you, but like one thing is one too many things. Or you, would you agree? So don't think that, well, I'm, I'm under grace. This, none of this applies. If you knew what grace really meant, you'd understand that all of this applies. Because grace is not just undeserved favor. Grace is the empowerment of heaven. Grace is the divine inspiration of God upon your heart with the outward reflection of God upon your life. Grace is the power tool of heaven. Grace is not just, well, I didn't deserve it, but he gave it. Praise God, I'm a sinner. No, you're not. You were saved from sin, now you become a saint in the eyes of the Father. Don't think that grace is just because you're a miserable sinner and God barely tolerates you. Just because you were taught by a pastor that God loves you, he doesn't have to like you, doesn't mean that your pastor taught the truth because that's a lie. God doesn't love you and tolerate you. God loves you profusely and his eyes never look away from him, you. He never looks away. The problem is, is we allow life to come, unforgiveness to come, issues to come, grumbling to come, complaining to come, and your eyes look away from his. 
He doesn't go, maybe he'll return one day. He goes, come on now. Come on now. I waited. That's the Father. He doesn't look away. When you turn away, he doesn't go, ah. It's not your dad. He's not just some earthly dad. He's a heavenly father that always looks at you, that knows that if you just turn, if you just catch his gaze again, if you just turn from your sin, turn from your stuff, and just look at him, he's always looking at you. He never looks away. He's got time for everyone. He never looks away. He's always looking at us. He's a good father. We get mixed up with all our stuff. Our tragedies are trash. We allow all kinds of stuff to come in to be the gospel, but none of it is. God loves you with an everlasting burning heart of love. And he wants to carry us through this life, but he wants us to carry him. And he doesn't want us to just have a fire. He wants you to be a bonfire. He wants you to burn and be the light of the world again. He doesn't want you to be caught up in all the offense and all the junk and all the he said, she said, wonder if, where are we going? What are we doing? Can't believe it. Drop it. Drop it. It's stuff that is keeping you from having a prosperous soul. I want my soul to prosper. It's the biggest prosperity message in the gospel. And to be of good health. My body can be in physically good health. I want my soul to prosper. And a lot of your healing is contingent on this thing being completely free. I promise you. He said, this thing I have against you, you've left your first love return to your first love. Like, how do I even do that? I mean, God, I've been saved for 30 years and you're telling me to return to the same day? There's a lot that's happened. That's right. And over time, you've left surrendered to God to, to enter into just not surrendered, just incorporated. And he's in there. And yes, I go to church. So I'm going through the motions. I went to this place and this place and this place. And nah, they didn't love me there. I went over there. They didn't love me there. Over there, they didn't love me there. And I just can't find a place they love me because you don't know you're loved. You can't just be a part. All that stuff is tragedy and trash, and it's no good for your soul. It messes you up inside. It causes you to have a lot to say about nothing. It causes you to have a lot of rumors to spread, a lot of things to say. Well, I ought to give them a piece of my mind. Well, is it coming from God's mind or yours? We need to get free. We need to be free. I need you to come back to the second that you knew he was real. I need you to know the love of God that's in Christ Jesus so that you can finally be filled with the fullness of God. To be filled with the fullness of God is to know the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Wouldn't it be great if you woke up in love with Jesus this morning? Wouldn't it be great tonight when you went to bed? The only thing you could think about is how much you love the Lord and how important he is to you, and that he's actually there with you when you go to sleep. This is why I have peace every night I sleep. Come on, guys. Jesus said, come to me. All of you who are weary and burdened down and weighed down by life, come to me, and I will give you rest. That's what he says. So in the beginning, we get born again, and it happens. And this is, no more shackles, no more chains. Right? And we're good? And then we walk out of church and go through our first day at work. I got shackles. I got chains. And I go to Sunday church. Bam! Yeah, they're broken again. I am free. Come on. Let me go back to work. Oh my God, here they are again. I am... I am... It's not the gospel. It's not the gospel. Jesus wants us to forgive. If I hurt any of you, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I can't go back. I can only 
be burning. Go forward. I can only say I'm sorry. It's not on me for you to believe it. It's on you. The people that have offended us and hurt us, I don't need them to say they're sorry. I need to see them for their created value and what God thinks about them. It's real. I can't afford to live in a place where it gets yucky. I can't for a moment. I can't afford to think, I can't afford to think less of William than what God does. And, and I ask the Holy Spirit in my heart always with every leader, with everybody that I'm around. Lord, let me see them like you see them. And if my mind ever thinks otherwise, I ask you to bring that thought captive to truth so that I can immediately bless them. This is every day of my life. You think that by getting here, it gets easier. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Please don't just get into ministry because you think it's your niche. <laughs> the Bible says, let not many of you be teachers. Why? Because teachers will be judged way more strictly. Are you with me? Can I read something to you real quick? This is the only place I can go to preach a forever service, so just hold on. You guys all right? Your kid's crying. I'm like, oh gosh, I'm pushing it. I want you to go to Luke with me. I want you to go to Luke 12. Ooh, ooh, it's been a roller coaster for me this morning. I love him so much. He loves me. Guys, I mean, he's head over heels for me. You can think what you want. Be like, well, that's arrogant. No, you just don't know who you are. God has enough of him to go around for all of us. Amen. If he has more thoughts than outnumber the grain of sand in the world for each one of us, that's intense. What if you got a hold of 20 thoughts? Your whole life would change. What if you got a hold of 200 thoughts that God had for you? you could, it wouldn't matter what people think about you. You'd just be like, oh, 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 oh. I'm only at four thoughts. Oh. Oh. Really? Oh. All day, every day. Yeah, but what about life? He is the way, the truth, and the life. Uh. Okay, are you ready? Okay. Verse 35, let your waist be girded and your lights burning and you be like men waiting for their master to return for the wedding banquet. Do you believe he's coming back? Yes. Do you? Yes. Guess how you're supposed to live your life? With your lights burning, your waist girded, like ready to go as when men waiting for their master return the wedding banquet so that he may open the door immediately for him when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master will find watching, 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 looking, thinking, praying. My, my house is a house of prayer. These are people. What did Jesus say to the disciples before he went over and prayed? Watch and pray. Why? Watch and pray so that you might not enter into temptation. What keeps us free from temptation? Watching and praying. This is a big deal. Come on, the more you watch and pray, the less stuff's going to whisper your name because you're listening to him who's speaking your name. Oh, blessed are those servants whom the master will find watching when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself and have them come sit down to dine and he will come and serve them. And if he comes in the second watch or comes in the third watch and finds them so, blessed are those servants. But know this. I don't know if we read this stuff. I love this stuff. 
If the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would have watched and not have allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, be ready for the Son of Man. He is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Peter said to him, I love this. The disciples are like, uh, 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 Lord, uh, I love it. This is so good. Um, Are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? Just us or everybody else too? I mean, because it feels like you're speaking to me. Are you with me? Are you serious? Are you here? Lord, like you're telling all these people and you're telling, but are you just telling us or everybody? Just say it's for everybody because it's too painful to just be for me. I don't know. Has, has the Lord ever spoke to you and you're like, you mean everybody? Yeah. Right? It's a new thing for me. Okay. Sorry. The Lord said, who then is the faithful and wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his house, his servants, his house servants to give them their portion of food at the proper time. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing. Doesn't even say so talking, doesn't see so acting like so doing, meaning they're active in their watching. They're active in their pursuit of God. They're active in their life. They're not just talking about it. They're actually doing it. Doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will appoint him over his possessions. But if that master says in his heart, his master delays his coming. Now, this is crazy. And he says, and it it begins to beat the house servants, both men and women, and eat and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not look for him at an hour when he is not aware. And he will. I don't know if you read this correctly, but I'm just going to read it. Just listen. He will cut him into pieces and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. What does that mean, Lord? That sounds kind of painful. He's saying that the person's not looking, they're not watching, but this person absolutely knew exactly who God was, relaxed the standard, started to act haphazardly towards people, started to eat and get drunk. In other words, be intoxicated with something other than Jesus. And the only thing that intoxicates you more than or other than Jesus is the world. You'll either be intoxicated, intoxicated, influenced by the world or influenced by Jesus. These were influenced by the world and started to live in an ungodly manner to do ungodly things. He says that I will cut him to pieces and appoint him his portion with unbelievers, meaning This person was a leader. This person was somebody that was a head over. This is what I read to make sure that I keep my heart in check because you want to be a teacher. You want to be a pastor. You want to be, this is stuff leaders need to know because if you're going to go into this thing and you believe you're called to ministry, you're, you're called to not be cut in two. Okay. That servant who knew his master's will, go kid, that's leaders. Well, that's just this servant who knew his master's will, but did not prepare himself or do according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. Wait a minute. Like, first guy gets cut up. Second guy still gets whooped. Like, with many stripes. Like, how many is many? I don't know, but it's punishment, and it's not acceptable. Are you guys with me? This paints a different picture of heaven. I don't know where it is. Somehow we got this picture that we're just going to go up there and float around and eat grapes. and It's just not... Okay, no, I won't go there. But he unknowingly, so this guy didn't know, this one didn't know, but a committed acts worthy of punishment shall be beaten with few stripes. Now listen to this. For to whom much is given of him, much shall be required. And from him to whom much was entrusted, much will be asked. Jesus said, I have come to send fire on the earth and I wish that it was already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with and how pressed I am until it's accomplished. Do you suppose I have come to give peace on the earth? Nope. I tell you this, but rather division. There will be from, there will be from now on five divided in one house, three against two, two against three. They will be divided father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, and mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He talks about making sure that you judge your own heart. This is a big deal. So so this is not just to to the leader, to the person up front. 
This is to everyone. My heart cry is that we would live with clean hands and pure hearts, free from the debris of offense towards anybody. People do and say horrific things. That doesn't mean that you need to be the product of that. You do not have to be the product of people that say horrific <laughs> and terrible things. I have gotten the ability from the Father when I was a couple years saved to hear the hearts of people, what they're saying instead of what they're vocally saying, what they're thinking. That doesn't mean that I'm some kind of weird guy. God started doing it with my family. Started doing it because they hated me and they didn't like me and they would say nice things to my face, but God started to show me what they were saying behind the closed door. When he, when he first did it, it was at my mother-in-law's house. It was with uh, Jackie's brother and his sister-in-law and another brother, another sister-in-law. I would come there for Thanksgiving and I would walk up to the door and the Holy Spirit would share intimate conversations they were having behind the door about me. I would go into the house and they'd say, hey, it's good to see you. And I knew what they were saying. And it wasn't something of me accusing them because I had no knowledge of any of it. And the Lord would say to me, does this bother you? And I said, no, Lord, I pray for them. He goes, that's why I tell you. I don't know if you and I are ready to handle that. But if you would keep your heart pure, your hands clean, you would know what people are saying. Jesus knew the thoughts of men. Are you with me? So I'm not telling you something that's out there. I'm not a psychic. I'm just telling you that God would give me as a word of knowledge, word for word, what people were saying. And because it didn't hurt me, it enabled me to see who they really were and not see them according to the flesh. This is one of the tools that he's given me to keep my heart from being offended. But could you do it? Could you handle it? Could you handle it walking up to somebody saying hi and walking away, knowing that they were saying horrible things before you walked up to you? Would you still say hi with the same hello and love them through it? Or would you hold a fence and keep a record of wrongs? I don't want that stuff. So he's enabled me to live with that, but not ever act on that in a bad way. I remember one time when God allowed me to do it, and I'll share this testimony, then we're gonna take communion and we're gonna get rid of some stuff so we can go after this new year blazing on fire and burning with passion and, and not be held up by any of the junk. It's always Matthew, guys. It's okay. He loves Jesus full on. He loves Jesus. People are like, just know in your hearts, Matthew. But, but, but he's authentically passionate about God and loves God. People are like, well, I just wish he'd tone it down. God wishes you'd turn it up. Well, that's not how he made me. Well, maybe you should step into what he says you are. All right. So I remember the day, you remember too, so I walked in and they were saying those things about me. And I walked into my mother-in-law's house. And I keep in mind, I, burned, I hurt everybody in my all sides of family. I walked in, and the Holy Spirit told me, you can share with her what she was saying. I go, I can't. So I said, hey, Jamie. I said, can I talk to you for a second? She goes, yeah, what's up? And I said, you know, I said, I've been, come, I've been saved for a few months. She goes, yeah, 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 we know. And, and she goes, you know, she goes, yeah, yeah, we appreciate that. I said, yeah. I said, then why do you keep saying and I shared with her about three or four things that she said over the last couple times I've seen her. She trembled. She goes, what? She goes, how do you know that? I said, the Lord told me. She goes, ah! She lost it. And I said, well, it's okay. She goes, no, I can't believe you knew. I said, yeah, I've known for a couple months. She goes, oh my God, I'm such a jerk. I said, no. I said, I hurt you and lied and threatened to kill Jackie for all those years, and now we're married, and you don't know that this is real or not. We go to church, there's cliques, there's all this. We don't even know what you believe. What is happening? I said, do you want Jesus? She goes, yes! <laughs> and my sister-in-law got born again. I went and got you, and I said, come here. I want you to meet our new sister. <laughs> How powerful was that? Could God have done that if I lived with a heart of offense? I'm not boasting in me. I'm telling you something that's available. And if you would keep your heart clean, and if you would stop just <laughs> presuming and assuming, and if you'd stop your gossip, 
Stop. It's okay. Love babies. I want another one. She shooed me. We have 26, 17. How old are you going to be soon? Come on, tell them. I'm going to be 10. She's 12 right now. It's going to be a teenager soon. Then we have another little seven-year-old and a four-year-old. I think we should have a one-year-old. <laughs> Pray for my wife. No, I'm just kidding. Sorry. No, it's all right. Guys, God wants us to be free. Life is too short. Wouldn't you like to leave this place today completely free of debris, entering back into your first love, loving God, free from being offended? I am telling you right now that there is a weight that unforgiveness and offense carries to it that keeps you weighed down, and before you know it, you feel like, oh, wow. You go to church, and the Music's not as cool anymore. Even though it was amazing, you're just you're not connecting. Why? Because you just it takes you 15 minutes just to enter in. It takes you 20 minutes. The more offense you have, the longer it takes you to enter in. And even when you get there, you're not where you should be. This is real. Like, wouldn't you like to come in and before worship is going, you're you got Matthew going on? I'm serious. Like, what would it be like? It can be yours today. It can be yours right now because worship is everything. It's not just the songs you sing. It's the life you live. It's the air you breathe. It's, it's the thoughts and all the mindsets that you've gathered from assuming and presuming and just being hurt. We don't need that stuff. Guys, keeping no record of wrongs is a big deal. Unforgiveness you know you can walk in freedom when you see that person and you're not hurt by them anymore. You don't just go, oh, there they are. Like, aren't you tired of ducking people? Like, I've met so many people that they're like, oh. hey, how you doing? I'm okay, how you doing? But really, something's wrong. I don't want that stuff in my heart. I want to be free from that. Don't you want to be free from that? Like, we need to be free. Amen? I want us to come back to first love. I want us to be like that baby. Yeah. <laughs> Serious. I want you to sleep well at night. I want you to be healed in your physical body. I want you to wake wide and alert in the morning where you are excited with the first thing you think about is God, thank you for this morning. I want to wake up every morning and I'm, God, I love, thank you. Another day. Lord Jesus, thank you. I love you where my heart is warm inside. I want to go to bed at night with my heart warm inside. Your heart can't be warm inside with his presence if you're carrying that stuff because offense will deny presence. You don't want that stuff. There's no greater thing than to have God all the time. Amen? All right. Okay. Let's take out this whatever it is today. These are actually way better. Thank you. Good choice. These are not that, that one wafer thing. When we do communion, we'd hand around that matzah bread, you know, you break off a piece of it. It's like a saltine. Or when people really do it well, they get the nice fresh loaf. Mm. Mm. That's a lot of loaves to go ahead around. Yeah. All right. Hold the bread in your hand, please. Okay. I would encourage you to do communion on a pretty regular basis. Do it with your wife. Do it by yourself for sure, no matter what. Always don't deny this place right here because this is a place where when we do this, we're remembering him, but when we do this, I, I want God to mark you today that you'll never be able to do this offended again. I want him to mark you today that you'll never be able to do this offended again. You will only be able to do this with an unoffended heart. And if you do it regularly, you keep your unoffended heart clean. You just keep it pure. You don't. But I want, I want you to know, and it says this, on the night that he took the bread, it says on the night that he was going to be betrayed, he took the bread. 
the key to that is that he knew he was going to be betrayed, and so he took the bread. So I want you to understand something. This Christian life is full of betrayal. Full of betrayal. So every time you take this bread, I want you to think, I could be betrayed. That's okay, because you were betrayed. You did it all for me. God, thank you. Lord, we thank you for the body. I thank you right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the bread. Thank you for your body, God. You paid a price for me, Jesus. You were broken for me. God, thank you. You were striped. You were whipped. You were beaten. God, it says there were seven different places that you shed blood on that tree and before that tree. God, I thank you for the crown of thorns. I thank you for the spear in your side. I thank you for the near pearls. I thank you for the beatings, God, the beard being ripped out. Everything, Lord, we love you. We love you, we love you, we love you. Father, we thank you for the bread. I want you to, I want you to take one of your pieces and I want you to look at it. And we say, God, I thank you for the body of Christ. I thank you for every person. Lord, thank you for every person, all the people that I've been offended by. I'm letting them go right now. I do not want to walk in offense. God, I'm asking you to take this heart and purify it. Lord, I let them go right now. I forgive and I let them go. I let them go. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do, just like you did on that tree, Lord Jesus. You said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do, just like you did, Jesus. And they beat you unmercifully, and they absolutely obliterated you to where you were unrecognizable. And Jesus, we know you became unrecognizable so that we could become recognizable again. Father, thank you for your body that was broken for me. Lord, we love you. We do this in remembrance of you with a clean conscience, with pure hearts and clean hands. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I tell you right now, to somebody that's fasting, that was pretty amazing right there. <laughs> I ain't gonna lie. Anybody got an extra bread? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry. That was good. Woo! My eyes just went. Whoa! All right, let's do this. Yes. Sorry. Whoa. Father, we thank you for the blood. We thank you for this covenant, God. You have forgiven us. God, you didn't just forgive us. You removed our sin. God, you said in this covenant, this is the covenant that I will make with them. Their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. God, you don't remember our sin. You remember it no more. You removed our sins as far as the east is to the west. Jesus, we love you. We don't want to now sin and get away with it. We want sin to get away from us. Father, let us live an amazingly pure life. We thank you for the blood. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for the blood that washes us white as snow, God. I thank you that when you see us, you see us through your son. Lord, you see us as a blood-washed bride. Father, we thank you. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you. Would you just thank him? Would you thank him with your whole heart right now? Just personally, would you thank him? Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for forgiving me, God. Thank you for setting me free. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you. God, I thank you for the freedom from addiction in the name of Jesus. God, I thank you for the meal that heals. In the name of Jesus, God, I thank you for freedom from any disorder that drugs had brought into my life. I thank you for the, for the healing, for any bit on my skin that's a residue of a life I used to live. I thank you for any transmitted disease that was brought in through a life of sin because we get forgiven. Therefore, we have the complete ability to be healed. God, we thank you that everything leaves, cutting scars, track marks, everything. Lord, we love you. We thank you for covenant. 
Father, we worship you. We worship you. God, we give you glory. Thank you. Thank you, Papa. Lord, we covenant with you. We thank you. Every time we do this, we do this in remembrance of you. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. Thank you for the blood, God. Thank you, God. We worship you. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, wow, that was good. <laughs> yeah, I done too. <laughs> Can I get the worship? Can I get some worship up here? I just want to pray. Wow, adrenaline. Bah, rah. What? You guys got to pee or what's up? The children? They just left. My own wife left. <laughs> what is happening? There's only one bathroom. Is that the kids? What's that sound? That was awesome. It was the Lord. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Oh, Jesus, I love you. Thank you so much, God. Thank you. Can everybody stand real quick? We are seeing people healed. Seeing people healed like never before. Absolutely wonderful. Just got a picture back from, was at a place called James River Church one Wednesday night. And we had a, we we had so many people rededicate their life to Jesus. It was packed. It was a Wednesday night service. It was like 3,600 people in a 3,000-person house. Powerful. It's the largest assembly of God church in America where God is moving there. It was crazy. We had so many miracles. We had eight deaf ears open. It was amazing. Right in. So good. Just from people praying for each other. But somebody, pastor sent me a picture of, a, of an ankle where the bones, the bones on the ankle were, were broken. I sent him to Costi today. Look at this. See the, see the break. After. Where two bones were broken on both sides, and and they were in, and they weren't even on camp. They were at another campus watching live stream, and somebody because it's not about me praying; it's about us praying as the body. So people prayed for them. They went back to the doctors. They were di- they broke their ankle on the third of January. They went to the doctor on the fourth, and the bones were completely healed. And the doctor said, "I guess God has healed you." You can resume to all activity. But they have, the, they have the, the x-rays, which is awesome. I love it. I want to pray for healing, but I want to know, like, I was planning something completely different today. I really was. I was in Proverbs 2 this morning and Psalm 145, and I was in Hosea, and I'm like, yeah, I'm so good. And I was gone when I came up here. So I want, to, I want to know, and I don't need you to congratulate me or thank me. I want to know whose heart received real freedom today. I just want to see that right there. It's awesome. I love you guys. I, I am so thankful for the house. I was up in Chicago at Risen up there. We, I started to preach, and there was a young man in the front that had a demon and he was like from the beginning and then we sent Gary over there and Gary just entertained it I'm just kidding I'm just kidding Gary's watching I'm sorry Gary I was just kidding it's a it's a common it's a it's a going joke because Gary was with us one time at a power and love and there was a demon manifesting and Gary came up and this demon laughed at Gary and I'm like oh my gosh dude and we never let him live it down 
<laughs> no, but, but Gary was working with this guy, and then we, the thing got cast out, and, and then the guy's coming back, and he's coming back to church up there, and he's healed and free from this demon. Like, amazing. But God wants to do stuff. He wants to heal. He wants us to be overwhelmed with His goodness and His mercy. So if you have anything at all that you need prayer physically for, I want you to put your hand up right where you're at. Come on. All right. All right. I want to get some people that are here around you. It's just people, hands that are around, not coming up front. Because I don't need you to come up front. Just, just put hands on people. You okay, William, if I do this? Okay. Come on, Jesus. How many of you believe that Jesus wants to heal? How many of you believe that Jesus wants people to be completely whole? Amen? Amen. All right. Okay, let's do this. All right. What are you, what are you dealing with, buddy? Okay, it's your whole body. The whole way down, right? All right, let's pray. Okay. And then what are you, what are you dealing with? Your heart? What's that? Okay. Okay. So your neck. Okay. So are you all. Okay. So both of you are all wrecked, messed up. We need you healed. Right? Come on. So my wife and I went through that stuff and I just, I felt like to point you guys out. Well, Jesus wants to heal you completely, just like he healed my wife and I completely. Okay? Put your arms around each other and pray for them as a couple because we want this to leave. So Father, we thank you for healing and wholeness right now. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for every disc being healed. We thank you for absolute wholeness and freedom. In Jesus' name, Lord, thank you. Be healed. Jesus' name. Disc be healed. Be whole right now. Every bit iron, you come back to where you belong in Jesus' name. You be healed right now. Jesus' name. Brand new squishy stuff, Lord. Brand new discs. In Jesus' name, be healed. Right now, back be healed, feet be healed. Everybody in this house, Lord, we thank you for healing and wholeness. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Be healed. Be whole. In Jesus' mighty name, be absolutely made whole. Father, thank you. Wholeness. Every disc, every cartilage, every tendon, in Jesus' name, Father, we thank you for absolute wholeness and freedom. Right now, be healed. Right now, be whole. In Jesus' name, be healed. Be whole. Father, I thank you. Every joint, every bit of connective tissue, every nerve, every cell, be healed. In Jesus' name. Father, thank you for wholeness. In Jesus' name. Absolute freedom. Jesus, absolute wholeness, freedom, healing. Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. We ask you for more. Lord, we love you. More. Jesus. Healing, wholeness. Be healed. Body be made whole. In the mighty name of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, more. Father, thank you for more right now. Increase. Jesus, I want you to say that. Come on, increase, Lord. More. More. Increase. Healing, wholeness. In Jesus' name, be healed. Be made whole. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, be healed. Be whole. Every disease, get out. Now. In Jesus' name, we command this to let go now. Now. In Jesus' name. God, thank you for doctors confirmed healing and wholeness. In the mighty name of Jesus, be free, be healed. Jesus, thank you. Wholeness. Wholeness. Every bit. 
Lord, I thank you that cancer would be completely healed in Jesus' name. Absolute wholeness in Jesus' name right now. Great freedom. Father, I thank you for immune systems being healed in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, more. We ask you for increase. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Absolute wholeness and healing. In the mighty name of Jesus, God, thank you. Great freedom. Jesus' name, thank you, Father. Wholeness and healing. You're good. Stay right there. All right. Healing and wholeness. Be healed right now. Father, I thank you. In Jesus' name, complete healing right now. Be healed. Be whole. Blood be healed. In Jesus' name. Organs be healed right now. Every cell. Father, I thank you for the doctors re-looking at a diagnosis of healing. Jesus' name, no more sickness, no more. In the name of Jesus, God, I thank you for absolute wholeness. Every organ you be healed in Jesus' name. Doctors confirmed in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Yes. Come on, God, more. Jesus, healing, wholeness. You be healed right now. You let her go in Jesus' name. I command you let her go. In Jesus' name. Great peace, God, right now. Great shalom in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for faith. In Jesus' name. We, we command fear to leave in Jesus name this is not the end in Jesus name you be healed body be made whole complete every symptom leave right now in Jesus name great freedom great freedom great freedom great freedom great freedom Jesus Jesus, great freedom, great healing in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, you be healed. Jesus, thank you. God, we love you. We give you honor and glory. In Jesus' name, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Thanks, God. 100% wholeness, God. Every cell you be healed. Thank you for this faithful man of God. One that has prayed his whole life. God, thank you. Every cell you be healed in Jesus' name. Be healed. Right now. Healing and wholeness, God. Absolute. Absolute freedom. Jesus. Be healed. Be healed. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Father, I thank you for every symptom leaving this place in Jesus' name. Leaving, leaving, leaving. Every symptom in Jesus' name. Thank you. Great freedom. Jesus, great freedom. Jesus. Thank you, Father. Jesus, thank you.
give you glory, God. We give you glory. We give you glory. Glorify thy name. thank you. I, I want you to check your body of any kind of physical healing that you can check right now. Check right now if you can, if you can check it. Tell a difference in your body physically. If there is a difference, I want to see your hands in the air. I want to see what's happening here. Wave your hand. If you know there's a physical difference in your body, wave your hands at me so I can see. That's awesome. What are you feeling right now? Yep. I want you to check. Come out in the aisle. Okay. Can you bend? Can you bend and check? I want you to bend and check your back. What's that? Completely gone. awesome so good father thank you in the name of jesus thank you for serving our country man thank you thank you thank you thank you 
I thank you on behalf of our country for serving us, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jesus, I ask you for more right now in Jesus' name. Right now, more for this man. More, I ask you for increase in Jesus' name. Right now. Lord, that he'd be okay with crying again. Because it's okay. God, thank you for your amazing grace over him. Lord, thank you for the empowerment of heaven upon his life. In the mighty name of Jesus, thank you for the freedom from all this pain. That the nightmare is over. God, thank you. Jesus name Lord thank you for his wife thank you for healing come on let's pray for your wife come on father we thank you in the name of Jesus spirit of infirmity get out of this neck right now in Jesus name we curse you and cast you out let her go now in Jesus name you be free right now neck you be loosed in Jesus name move your neck is it better it's not gone though. Come on, let's do it again. Hey, you are worth the blood of Jesus. You hear me? Look at me. You're a daughter of the King. He loves you. He loves you. Look at me. He loves you. You are his kid that he died for. He loves you. God's going to reveal himself as a father to you like you've never seen. It's going to be so good. Come on, the first part of this is the healing of your neck neck you be loose right now you let her go in Jesus name move it around again okay look at me Jesus thank you for your daughter that you love you let her go now I command you let her go neck you be loosed in Jesus name sleep you be restored freedom in Jesus name no more let her go now in Jesus name Check it again. Okay. Put your hand on there, hubby. Say this in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Get out. Get out. Let my wife go. Let my wife go. Now. Now. Neck you be loosed. Neck you be loosed. Life you be healed. Life you be healed. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Freedom. Freedom. I keep hearing the same word sleep your sleep is about to be restored to you in the mighty name of Jesus check it again it's leaving father we thank you spirit of infirmity get out and let her go absolute freedom and wholeness in Jesus name freedom and wholeness neck you be loosed in Jesus name I break this thing off of your family because it's tried to touch your whole family in the name of Jesus we break it right now there is no curse that makes it through the generational bloodline of Jesus buddy right now in Jesus name we break this thing off of your kids in Jesus name no more torment in Jesus name no more fear no more fear no more you hear me? No more fear for you. He loves you so much. What's your name? Blaine. I love you, Blaine. Bless you, buddy. It's your mama. It's your mama. Amen. Father, we thank you for absolute freedom. In Jesus' name. 100% wholeness. Thank you. Brand new. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Be free. I see God touching your feet too. In Jesus name. Feet you be healed right now. In Jesus name. Be healed right now. Move around. Amen. Amen. You're doing good. This thing's completely gone. Amen. Amen, amen. All right.
Who else got healed? Raise your hands. Flip your hands at me. If you got healed of something today, put your hands up. Oh, there was a bunch of hands. Okay. Awesome. You good? You good? Come on. You good? Come on. That's good. Can we give Jesus a big shout? Come on. 